All right, guys, we'll get started. Um, so we're going to kind of change up the schedule a little bit. So first up is going to be Brent Kramer. So he's a fourth-year medical student from Iowa. going to be talking about uh, residual astigmatism after Torque IOL. So I'll let him get going. Hello, everybody. So as we said, I'm a medical student here for um, a month rotation at the Moran. I'm from the University of Iowa. Uh, the research I am presenting today on residual astigmatism after TORC IOL um, was done with Dr. Birdall and Dr. Harton. I'm also going to present a um, little research I did at the Iowa City VA with Dr. Oding as well. Um, and a quick tangent, um, I stopped in at Van Thompson Vision and I'm supposed to say hello to everybody from um, Russell Swan. So he's a really good guy. So I have no personal um, financial disclosures. So as I said, I'm going to present on um, some research I did with the Astigmatism Fix website, and then also some research I did at the Iowa City VA. So at the time of cataract surgery, um, patients with astigma um, corneal astigmatism can get a toric IOL in pursuit of spectacle um, independence. However, sometimes they're left unsatisfied with some um, refractory residual astigmatism. And this website created by Dr. Birdall and Harton um, was created and launched in 2012, and it helps surgeons manage these pati patients. And what the user does is enters the, um, the current or the post-operative refraction, as well as the TORC data, as you can see here at the bottom. Um, and then when you hit Calculate, it gives you um, this little printout, and it tells you the expected residual refractive astigmatism if you were to rotate to the ideal location. And then you can see here how far you have to rotate, and then at the bottom is just a little diagram of the potential residual astigmatism if the IOL is rotated to any axis within the eye. So to break it down, um, just a quick background on refractive residual refractive astigmatism. Um, two potential causes are either wrong power, so the power of the actual toricity, or wrong location. And the wrong location itself can be broken down into two subcategories of wrong intended axis. So that means you wanted to put the IOL at 20 degrees, potentially is at 20 degrees, but the actual ideal axis is 30 degrees. Um, this is caused by, can be caused by a lot of things, but mainly just uh, measurement, calculation errors, unaccounted for surgically induced astigmatism, or unaccounted for posterior corneal astigmatism. <laughs> Also, the other category is misalignment. And with misalignment, um, that's mainly rotation or potentially you put the eye on the wrong rotation to begin with. So I looked at the data from astigmatism fix. Uh, I took the entries from mid-2012 and did my data or all through the end of last year, 2015. Uh, there were about 36,000 entries. And long story short, after a lot of filtering, we got down to 12,812 um, entries that were likely representative of actual patients. So this is our final data set we worked with. So of these 12,000, 8,229 had the intended um, orientation and the IOL type because those uh, prompts weren't required on the initial version of the website. And so looking at those, 70% um, of those IOLs were found to be misaligned by 5%. So that, remember, is kind of the IOL, likely um, post-operative IOL rotation. Uh, surprisingly, actually 76%, so more, were found to have an ideal axis shift of greater than 5 degrees. So remember, that's the um, potential like measurement error, calculation error, SIA, um, posterior corneal astigmatism. So I think this is a, a first big take home point. Um, when you're dealing with residual astigmatism in, in a patient and you're okay, thinking your about please. rotating. Code red drill, Moran Eye Center, all over. <coughs> May I have your attention, please? Code red drill, Moran Eye Center, all clear. So when you're working with residual astigmatism and you're thinking about rotating an IOL, um, it's wise to use uh, toric back calculators such as astigmatism fix because potentially let's say you have an IOL that you wanted to place at 20 degrees you have a patient with blurry vision um, at one month out you dilate them and you find that IOL at 80 degrees you think well I'll just rotate back to 20 and that'll take care of the problem but 20 degrees might not be the ideal location um, due to 
just post-operative changes um, or earlier measurement error. So I think that's a, um, a big take-home point as well. So next, so back here, that um, 5600 that were found to be misaligned, we looked at those specifically, and we stratified them according to the manufacturer. And you'll see that Acrosoft and Technus um, are the, the big players in the market, which is, um, was expected. And what we did is we compared those to the estimated usage of these Torque IOLs in the US um, from a market scope survey. And we found that the, the Technus Torque IOL was a little bit overrepresented in the um, misalignment or um, post-operative rotation category. And so the odds ratio for that was two and a half. So about two and a half times more likely to rotate in the eye from an external validation. We then looked at an internal validation. Um, so what we did was we took those same numbers and then we compared the total number of entries. So there's that 8200 number again. And once again, we found the Technus IOLs were a little bit more um, likely to rotate than the Acrosoft and a similar odds ratio there. So two different mechanisms of internal and external validation showed that the Technus IOL was a little bit more likely to rotate uh, than the Acrosoft IOL. And the true line and stars didn't really have um, enough power to, to consider them in the calculations. So moving on, can reorientation help? These are just some, um, some numbers. So initially, all, play, all, all comers to the website had about a residual astigmatism of 1.8. And by rotating the IOLs to their ideal location, um, you can reduce that, reduce over a diopter of astigmatism. Um, that's about a 54% reduction overall. And about 40% of the, um, the entries into the website could be uh, minimize or residual astigmatism could be minimized to below half a diopter. So finally, I'll get to the um, research I did at the Iowa City VA, and I looked at all the IOLs that were implanted um, for about a 13-month span from February of 2015 uh, to March of this year, and we implanted 634 IOLs. 98 of them were Torx. So that's about a 15 and a half percent rate. And for, during this time, we were using the Acrosoft Torque IOL calculator. Uh, 41 of those 98 patients had with the rule stigmatism, and 26 of those patients had a um, manual refraction at their one month follow up. <clears throat> so, looking at those 26, 21 or 80% of them with, pre -op, um, with the rule stigmatism flipped to against the rule stigmatism, but with using the Acrosoft Torque IOL calculator. <clears throat> and then when, we retro or when I retrospectively entered the data into the Barrett, Barrett Toric IOL calculator, uh, 18 of those 21 were, it was recommended that a lower IOL power was used. Um, so just a quick background on the Barrett Toric IOL calculator, one of the biggest differences between that and the Acrosoft and other calculators is that it considers posterior corneal astigmatism. Um, so this finding actually supports Koch's findings um, that there's about a mean posterior corneal astigmatism of negative three diopters in the, the steep axis and about 90, almost 90% 90 of highs. So just to kind of phrase it one more way, um, if you don't consider posterior corneal astigmatism, this small study supports uh, basically what we already know that you will overcorrect with the rule astigmatism and potentially flip the axis to, against the rule. So just a quick conclusion, the big take home points from the studies that we talked about today was using a toric back calculator is important with residual astigmatism. Um, the Technus IOL, which is an AMO lens, is found to be a little bit more unstable, potentially unstable, um, than the Acrosoft lens. Reorientation can significantly help. Um, and then finally from the Iowa City VA study, we found that not considering posterior corneal astigmatism um, can potentially lead to overcorrection of with the rule stigmatism. Thanks. Any questions? Um, yep. That was a really nice talk. Um, one thing I've been wondering about is when we actually know what the posterior corneal astigmatism is in that patient because we have a pentacam. Um, I don't know if you know you can answer this question or if someone else can in the audience, but is there a calculator that takes into account our pentacam measurement of the 
posterior astigmatism in that patient instead of just using like a normal gram like the Barrett does, and, or is that in development somewhere? I, <clears throat> I personally don't know of a calculator where you can enter the posterior corneal measurements in. Um, there's a few devices like the Pentacam, the Galilei, that can measure the posterior corneal astigmatism. It's, I don't believe it's a direct measurement. It's kind of an algorithm of its own. Um, but yeah, to answer your question more directly, I don't think that there is anything, any calculator. Does anybody else know of a calculator? I think the two big things is the, the Barrett and then also the Baylor monogram. Just an update, the Microsoft calculator has changed now. It has. So it now includes the Barrett. Okay. The, okay. Yeah, so when you go online to plug in uh, your data into the Microsoft calculator, it does include Barrett now. Awesome. So I just want to make sure everybody heard that the Microsoft calculator does you can include the pull, or it does um, factor in both your phone. Awesome. Thanks, guys.